welcome to the Helsus uh, Global South Encounters uh, with me, Franklin Obiodum, currently uh, the Associate Professor of Sustainability Science with Global Development Studies as the chair. If you would like to stay connected uh, between the encounters, I would like to draw your attention to our new Twitter account and just ecological political economy, the Helsus Global South blog, uh, links to which you can see in the chat box. The specific theme for the 2023 uh, GSCs is resource wars, cities and sustainability. Um, Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine has plunged the world into what has been called polycrisis. The cascading effects of multiple crises at the heart of which are natural resources. Environmental crisis, what the economist calls the environmental cost of, uh, the Ukraine, of Ukraine's war, uh, have been devastating. In Ukraine, uh, protected areas have been destroyed. Plant and animal biodiversity has suffered as toxic war, ke uh, war chemicals have killed and maimed not only humans, but also plants uh, and animals. Farmland is now widely contaminated. Air pollution has worsened as 42 million tons of carbon dioxide have been released into the atmosphere uh, in this year long war. Uh, or more than even a year now. Placing a monetary value on all these environmental crises is Herculean, but some estimates put the damage around 46 billion US dollars. From Russia and Europe more widely to Australia and North America, the ramifications of the war have been devastating. Uh, through food and fuel markets, this war has shot additional hail of war over the global south. Investigated at uh, the Peace Research Institute Oslo have documented increased protests related to rising food and fuel costs in the global south. The consequences of war have been global. So today, many seek answers to existential questions about the causes of war, the end of war, reconstruction after war and sustainability in the shadow of war. Existing interpretations of the war center around culture, either the obliteration of Russian culture or the extension of and resistance to Western culture. But is the culture of war a sufficient explanation? Could we also consider such global conflicts to be resource wars? If so, why and how are cities, especially urban land and land rent, so important in such resource wars? Could a different political economy of land create the conditions for peace? Our speaker today, Charles Avila, a former mayor of Tanuan Leyte in the Philippines, will address these questions. Avila's passion for and faith in cities, land, and justice led him to study the early writings of the church on private ownership. This investigation led to the publication of Ownership, Avila's widely acclaimed book, which not only shows that such early writings frame private property in land as the root of social problems, but also that common in the land would address pressing crises such as war. The question, of course, uh, is how to come on the land through war, peace, or some negotiated rapprochement. Director for Social Justice of the Lay Society of St. Arnold Johnson and a skillful scholar activist, Avila is also the Secretary General of the Asian Cultural Forum uh, on Development and an executive member of the International Union for Land Value Taxation, of which he is one of the representatives uh, to the United Nations. Avila is clearly a man of peace, but how can a peace advocate also be an advocate, an organizer of radical 
peasants' movements. Avila's ownership uses church teachings to urge, nudge, or organize peasants to rise up, a form of radical theology. But as one critic points out, the church is itself complicit in war, property, and empire. Is Mr. Avila a walking contradiction? Uh, is resistance, particularly land struggles in the global south, a path to global peace? Or is peace the product of contradictory wars? Welcome, Charles. You can now uh, unmute um, and give your talk. Thank you. Um, I think I will just uh, give my presentation immediately. Mm -hmm. I have that slideshow. Would you be able to assist me with that, or shall I just uh, go yes. ahead with it? So, so the yes, you you can you, you can also put your your phone down because we can we can already okay. we can hear you on Zoom. Okay. But you can, so I will... You can put yes. the phone down, and but leave the WhatsApp open. Okay, thank you. So, I can, am I, if it's possible to... Uh, My friends, to share. the universe story is one thing. Now that scientists quite unanimously tell us how the Big Bang started it all, some 13.8, billion years ago. The story of Earth, however, is another matter. A 4.5 billion year old planet that uniquely and solely developed life in its own good time, also evolved very late in the day, a certain group of Earthlings, we can go to the next slide, the human species, a group that has become powerful and insane enough to be in position to destroy life in the very planet of its origins. It is quite important then to grasp the human story in its essence and trajectory. I have written lots about how the welfare of human being, being, in a give, any given society depends completely on the notion of having, having that that society entertains. Yes, thank you. It was in Rome very early on that the concentration of property in private hands began based on the fundament, foundational and legitimizing idea of absolute and exclusive individual ownership in land and the commons. It is probably one of the least acknowledged but most amazing phenomena in all human history that such an idea as the Roman law concept of ownership would suffuse the thinking of almost all the governments of the entire world, not just for decades or centuries long, but for millennia up to today. Choose your data if you wish, but you'd all be generally correct if you note that today, less than 1% of the world's population holds more than 50% of all its wealth income and power. The majority world is majority poor. A tiny minority unceasingly robs the many of what is rightly and morally belongs to them. And so this gap between the minority rich and the majority poor keeps growing so precariously becoming ever more explosive is their hope for humanity, is their hope for the planet. Let's see towards the end of this presentation. Meanwhile, allow me to highlight 
the Philippine case of invaders and resistors and the incalculable costs of imperial wars that aim to take foreign lands by force. Let me immediately take you to year 1521. Armada de Maluco, conceived and commanded by Ferdinand Magellan, was unquestionably the greatest human achievement on the sea. Starting out as a voyage to the unknown, it established that the great diversity of peoples actually form a single humanity circumscribed by one round planet Earth. But one result of the Magellan expedition, despite the realization of a single humanity, was the question as to the ownership of Earth, its people, and its wealth. Who should own the world? Okay. The tradition of Magellan's faith in a teaching long forgotten held that the earth belongs to all. But his circumnavigation of the world now proved that there was truly a wonderful finite earth to fight over. He had gone around it the first one ever, and in the process, secured for Spain the first crack at building an empire upon which the sun never set because it would now embrace the entire spherical Earth's 71% maritime and 29% landed natural wealth. As Pak Minister Fuller remarked, all empires were heretofore seemingly infinite systems in the sense of open systems. The empire Magellan ushered was history's first spherically closed finite system. The first overseas global empire, it also became the epicenter of world action in the 250 years of the first globalization spearheaded by the Manila Acapulco trade, which started in 1572 and should have been more accurately called the great trans-Pacific, trans-Atlantic trade during that long time before there ever was a Suez or Panama Canal. At the very outset, the instruction of King and Emperor Charles to the Armada was clear and quite detailed. He said, as a takeover armed force, the Armada was to establish military bases and garrisons wherever it was worth it, with an eye to the gold and the spices and all the wealth of the occupied lands. Discovery meant the Roman ownership law of first occupancy, which was almost always accompanied by armed invasion. But since they would hardly ever be first occupants, really, in that anywhere there might already be locals in place, the instruction of Charles was that the locals, quote, must be treated most affectionately to influence them to become good Christians, which is our principal desire, and that they may with goodwill serve us and be under our government's subjection and friendship." Unquote. So clearly then, Christian civilization was perceived to be a strategic instrument to get the locals to be docile and accepting of foreign domination. Next slide. Before 1521, the tribal communities of the Philippine archipelago were certainly and admittedly not one nation. Hence, the invaders' use of sword and cross to gather them as one under the sound of the church bell 
ironically made possible the emergence of the Philippine nation. It was a process that King Philip II complained cost their royal coffers too much. He never asked how much it cost the local people themselves, who were now named after him, whose lines were being grabbed by church and state, who resisted the invaders' systematic appropriation of the lands they traditionally held in common. The invaders followed the old Roman adage, divide at impera, divide and rule. They introduced the Roman law concept of exclusivist and absolute ownership that created a local oligarchy or a society of a few non-producing owners with a majority of non-owning producers. The rent for the use of what belonged to all was monopolized by a few instead of being shared by all. So despite Christianization, or might we say because of it, the locals rose in more than 300 recorded revolts or one every year for 300 years until the big explosion happened in 1896, enabling the resistors to establish an independent, full-fledged national government at the end of that long process of the bloodiest human cost in terms of massacres, tortures, imprisonments, forced labor, taxations, and all other form of exploitation and domination. Okay, with the imminent downfall of Spain centuries after Magellan, other European countries who by then had business communities thriving in Manila now tried to hold on. Property ownership means to have and to hold. The Germans sent a warship from their East Asian squadron intending to acquire the Philippines should an adequate opportunity arise. But all opportunities were preempted by the Spanish-American War that would now become the War of America against the newly independent Philippines. Next slide. So year 1899, year one of the American Empire, the imperial idea was go to apply the Monroe Doctrine and say to the nations of Europe, hands off, this is our acquisition, our showcase republic in Asiatic waters. And go. So the myth was carefully nursed that there was merely a Spanish-American war in 1898 which almost magically landed the Philippines on Uncle Sam's lap after some treaty in Paris and the payment of a check to Spain, who was selling to America what no longer belonged to her, selling a property of 400 years now, an independent Philippines and its people for the price of $2 per head. In fact, the American president pretended to vacillate in the anti-historic decision to become an empire. Only, quote unquote, the desire for Christian civilization made him go for it, much like the King Emperor Charles in 1521. Said President McKinley, quote, there was nothing left for us to do but to take them all and to educate the Filipinos and uplift and civilize and Christianize them. And who? Poor Christ, whose name was always used in vain. Thus it was that no sooner had the Filipino patriots 
put an end to Spanish colonialism than they found themselves fighting another imperial foe. There could be no rest, it seemed, for those who would defend their right to exist on Earth. Explaining why the American Republic would turn imperialist, one U.S. Senator Beveridge said, we are a conquering race. We must obey our blood and occupy new markets, and if necessary, new lands. American factories are making more than they can consume. Fate has written our policy for us. The trade of the world must and shall be ours, unquote. That, coupled with the weird process of Christianizing a predominantly Catholic country and educating a nation whose universities were older than Harvard, resulted in the Holocaust. One Republican congressman said quite proudly after a visit to the Philippines in 1902, quote, our soldiers took no prisoners. They kept no records. They simply swept the country and whenever and wherever they could get hold of a Filipino, they killed him, unquote about a million of them, according to some historians. The official count had it that the U.S. sent 126,468 soldiers to fight the Filipino patriots in 2,811 battles, spent $500 million at the time to kill roughly 600,000 Filipinos, one of six the total population of Luzon at that time, made a howling wilderness of places like Leyte Samar that put up a strong resistance. And there ordered American soldiers, quote, to kill everything above 10. And then brag that they were now in a better position to uplift and civilize and Christianize the Filipino Catholics. Next slide. By 1913, with the Philippines now again a conquered land, the Tariff Act was passed by America, establishing free trade and product specialization between the U.S. and its new colon, effectively making of the Philippines a source of raw materials at cheap prices and a dumping ground for finished products at higher prices. Original forests occupied 70% of the country's land area around 1900 when the Philippines first came under the USA. Then imperial law classified trees as agricultural export crops. Because of that policy, with that one stroke of the pen, by 1946, when America formally left, only 30% of forests were left. Meanwhile, more colonial policies ensured that American corporations would monopolize the exploitation of mineral resources and the establishment of bigger farm plantations. Finally, when the inevitable local resistance threatened to blow up again like a volcano, the U.S. quite smartly let off steam by shifting from old-style imperialism to new-style neocolonialism. With local politics given unto the hands of the local oligarchy, but with security and economic policies merely an adjunct of American politics. That was the difference between old style imperial and neo colonialism. Japan challenged this in World War II and lost after four years of occupation. China has become the newest challenger to this century old American hegemony and limited Philippine sovereignty. 
the two China and America compete on many levels, but have no or very little respect for the Filipino people and for our common house of life, planet Earth. Both pursue a degenerative death economy and they seem incapable of seeing that there are no winners in a dead planet. Next slide. The narrative remains the same. The story of an ending imperial trade and the story of a people's indomitable spirit to resist both foreign and local exploiters on the basis of their firm belief that the earth belongs to all, not just to the powerful. The Philippines to Filipinos, the land to the pillar, the commons to all in common. So to the question, what future should we expect? The answer is nothing less than a more awakened populace who can build new structures of the economy and politics that will enable people to assert their sovereignty and promote social justice and recover the commons with programs like land reforms, just wages, and land value taxation to recover what belongs to all for the benefit of all and not just of a few. We might go back to historical basics, if you will. The problem of injustice in ownership is first of all, a problem of philosophy or ideology. Without a clear cut ideological alternative to the prevailing concept, movements for reform, no matter how many and how strong, ultimately fail. It was during the late Roman Empire that we saw the first condemnation of the status quo. It came from persons now known as the early Christian philosophers or church fathers. They went back, first of all, to the original religiously inspired distinction between what they called takoina, koina in Greek, things which by their nature were common for the use of all on the one hand, and what, on the other hand, they called ta idia, idia, or the things which by their nature and function could be justly owned privately in order to be used properly. In their view, we do not even own ourselves, absolutely speaking. Reacting to the Roman law concept, dominium, or absolute ownership belongs to the one absolute owner of all creation. Thus, the moral philosophical view was advanced that ownership of anything at all must be regarded in the nature of stewardship, not as in the Roman law concept in the nature of an absolute and exclusivist dominion. They confronted the established ownership concept and stood it on its head from being an instrument of exclusion and separation. They would now want it to become a tool of inclusion and community creation. Instead of an unlimited and absolute power, it was to be a limited one related to genuine human values. Instead of being considered an end in itself, it was to be considered a means to certain ends. A given country or community must agree among themselves, for instance, that the purposes of land, of land use might include the following three, food security for all, decent habitats for all, and an ecologically harmonious 
regime for the common good. Next slide. Way to go. Henry George in modern times, late 19th century onwards, updated and articulated best the tradition of the Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, regarding a philosophy of land ownership. Aside from land redistribution, land value taxation became the most practical and profound alternative to economic monopoly. In this realistic view, basic needs for all can be secured when we share, when we socialize rent and untax production. In the experience and consistent observations of the International Union, Areas that have been structured in a manner of land value taxation were able to eliminate land speculation, hoarding, and profiteering. The economy became both fair and efficient, fully capable of producing the basic necessities of life for all and generating an economic surplus that were distributed as basic income for all the people or as citizens' dividends. Thank you very much. You can hear me, but I cannot hear you, so I go back to my phone. <laughs> Sorry about that. Hello? Yes. 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 Thank you for all our participants. Charles is just getting some yes. instructions from Franklin on the next steps. So thank you very much for dealing with us in these small technical difficulties today, but I'm sure that we can all appreciate the wonderful presentation that Charles just gave. And if you have any questions that have come up, we welcome you to please write them down in the chat. Uh, that would be much appreciated as Charles cannot hear us with our voices today. So if questions have come up, please feel welcome to write them down in the chat and we will be moving into the question and answer period quite shortly. So just bear with us and thank you all for um, your patience with our small technical difficulties today, but we're so glad that you're all here. Just one minute. I think I, ca I can host uh, uh, just one minute. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, um, thank you so much, Charles, for um, an informative and thought-provoking talk. Um, there has thank been you. even more talk about war uh, in the past year, uh, especially, uh, but very limited insight uh, on the land question, even in the discussion uh, about imperialism uh, and war. Uh, the story of land receives uh, relatively little attention. Um, yes. My question is, why do you think that is? Um, and how did you uh, become engaged in this line of research uh, and practice, uh, looking yes. at land and the social consequences uh, of private land ownership um, and the private uh, appropriation of socially created uh, rent? And um, as you suggested, clearly pointed out, a stewardship view of, uh, of land could create the conditions uh, for peace. But, but what are the obstacles, uh, both local uh, and global, uh, to 
this particular alternative, for example, in the, uh, in the Philippines. Yes. Yes, thank you. Yes, indeed. Uh, well, there's a lot of talk about war. There's less or almost no in-depth investigation into the connection between land and war. For instance, one view often overlooked in regards to the conflict in Ukraine is who will permanently control the precious lands and natural resources of the area? Russian, the NATO forces, Western corporations through the Ukrainian oligarchy or the Ukrainian people themselves. If one can believe reports during the past year of conflict, Kiev lost and Moscow gained a significant part of the south of the country, Russia now controls about 80% of that region's territory, Zaporizhia region, including more than 90% of the agricultural land. We ourselves in the Philippines, so far away, are impacted by that conflict as we have been importing a lot of wheat from Ukraine and much of our fertilizer comes from there. And of course, uh, the impact on our own agricultural efforts is very negative. So your question, why is this the case? They don't talk about it because that is what war is all about. <laughs> I think that's the reason. Uh, from the time of Julius Caesar to the time of Putin and, and uh, Biden, this is what it is all about. By that in modern times would not merely be a referral to land and mineral resources, but everything that can be viewed as just there, which we did not make with our own effort, but the material from which and on which we actually create economies. Mm -hmm. So it is important to get this consciousness, this awareness to as many change agents as possible, to as many people as possible. So in the 15th century onwards, it was taken for granted that that was the moral way to go. Prime occupancy, invasion, uh, colonization. It has taken more than 500 years for uh, the Vatican, for example, to change its mind <laughs> on this idea. When I say more than 500 years, because from the 15th century, it took March 30th, 2023, yesterday. <laughs> yesterday. The Vatican formally denounces 15th century doctrine of discovery. I read early this morning. Used the doctrine used to justify colonizing indigenous peoples. The statement said that the 15th century papal bulls or decrees did not adequately reflect the equal dignity and rights of indigenous peoples and have never been considered expression of the Catholic faith. Hmm. So here we go. It has taken a Pope Francis, also known as Jorge Bergoglio, to try to undo the self-serving decrees of the papal Borgias, Alexander Borgia. It took a little time, but it's, it's, it's a good indication that things can change. Their real doctrine was buried. They did not talk about it. Imagine the founders of the church, Alexander, uh, 
uh, Clement of Alexandria, all the way to Augustine of Hippo. They were all very clear on how to view land ownership and how to view um, wealth. And uh, they were quite ex express and explicit about it. And uh, all the way to not just from the Latin side, but also the Greek side, John Chrysostom. I mean, that is what I tried to bring out on earth because they are there, but they were buried. <laughs> they were buried deep and they were not talked about until uh, lately. So you were asking the next part of your question, how did I get into it? Because uh, I was early recruited <laughs> into the, as a volunteer into the present movement. And uh, I, I was wondering all the time, uh, what really was just with regard to the land? Mm -hmm. And uh, how come the farmers who never had a formal education, they just had a very strong feeling that something was unjust, something was wrong. And so since I was in school, I decided to make it my uh, dissertation to look into this particular issue. And the result was the book that we talk about. Right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, the first question comes from uh, uh, Barry Gills. Um, Barry, please, would you like to ask the question yourself or did you want me to read it? I think it would be good if you could read it. So we have Barry Gills, uh, Bonwego, and um, uh, Olina Dronova uh, in, in that okay. order. Yeah, well, yeah, thanks, Charles, for that, for that presentation. And uh, it's really very good news to hear about the, uh, the reversal of uh, with 600 years later of the doctrine of discovery yes. and conquest uh, and so on, all of that. That's, that's extremely refreshing news. Thank you. I didn't know about that. Uh, but I just wanted to, to talk about uh, decommodification and recommoning. Uh, you know, it's like the, the framework you uh, you were discussing still relies on. I mean, in the base it doesn't seem to to overturn or abrogate private ownership. Oh, it taxes it. So but, I want to you go into a bit of more detail yes. about about the place of you know profound recommoning under community and collective ownership and and the ethics of stewardship applied to that. You know, what, maybe examples you know that you've seen that have worked or just in general, conceptually, what you think of that. Right. But Charles, did you, hear, did you hear Barry? I did not, I did not get everything. Would, would you be able to sum it up? Yes, I, can, I can read please, Barry, please. Uh, Barry's question. Um, Bar Barry, I think your question was this. Um, beyond, I think that's a, an abridged version, beyond land value taxation and socializing rent, could you please comment on decommodification and recommoning of land? Oh, yes. No. And the social relations of collective community stewardship. Should, should yes, I take thank that? You. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, I thank you for mentioning that, especially the commodification of land. You know, I come from the peasant movement. And the um, I'm so sorry to interrupt. We're having another alien to them than this present development of commodification, because to most of them, it is not so much the question of their so, owning the land, but the land owning them. Um, Frank, Frank, um, Charles, Charles, Charles yes. one, just one minute. I, I think that you might have to start your answer once again because because we yeah, yeah okay. There's a, there's some feedback. Yeah, if um, Charles could please, back, yeah. um, if he could mute his phone while he's answering, that will take away the feedback. So then he can still hear you, Barry, but we're not then also hearing him through his phone. Um, so please okay. accept okay. our apologies, Charles. But if you could start that one again, we really lost the first part. Okay, of the okay I'll explain. I'll explain. I'll say I tried to explain this. Um, so it, it seems that Charles, when when. Uh, when you are explaining or responding to Barry's question, you can yes. uh, mute mute your phone, or oh. so so that you okay. or you can even go off WhatsApp and just talk. We will be able to hear. 
Oh, okay. So okay. you can end the WhatsApp call and explain and respond to Barry. I can talk now. Can you hear? Yes? yes. Okay. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Barry, for your remarks, for your question. I was saying that uh, uh, I am particularly happy with your mentioning commodification because to the peasant movement, which I which I belong, and uh, the indigenous peoples with whom I work, uh, nothing could be more foreign than uh, this new development of commodification. Because their view is uh, has always been that not so much that they own the land, but that the land owns them. They have come from the land uh, itself, and they have a great respect for the source of their of their being. Now, uh, people come and go; the land remains. We become again part of the land after uh, we have had our own tenancy on earth, and. The idea now of especially uh, modern capitalists who have tried to liberate most of the people from old style feudalism, uh, the old landlord tenant uh, relationship, um, but to be brought into a new slavery, a, a, a new style of, uh, of um, slavery uh, based on modern capitalism, that is being recognized now more and more. It's really very dangerous. And uh, so I agree with you and thank you that we have to watch out for that. Good. Hello? Okay, so Charles, Hello. the second Hello. person Hello. comes. Yeah, that was very clear. And the second yeah. question comes from Bondwego. Um, I'll have to read it. Uh, yes. <laughs> Bond's question is this. Isn't, isn't it that inequality issues, including in the context of backward capitalist development in the Philippines, have yes. become more complex, have become yes. more complex now due to financialization? The Philippines. You do financial? Uh, financialization. Yeah. Yes, sir. The Philippines has some institutions on land registry. Hence, calls for wealth tax is feasible if it is only based on land valuation. But now, the sources of wealth of the Filipino oligarchs are so diverse due to financialization. Oh, I see. Yes. Yeah, so, I agree so, with that. So, so Charles, uh, bon. we, can, we can end the call and yeah. then we can just talk. That's right. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Bon, for the insight. I, and I agree with you. Uh, it looks on first, uh, at first look, at first glance, that the oligarchs have uh, uh, gone away from appreciating the value of land. But take a closer look, that is not the case. The, the richer the oligarchs, the more they hang on to the land. Because land is the source of all their wealth in the banks. Land is the source of all their wealth, uh, modern wealth. Um, a, a, a new finance capitalism is still in the Philippines, in, as in, I think, in most third world countries, very much land-based. So, uh, if you look at the old oligarchs, the Ayala's, uh, Ayala Center, uh, Ortiga Center, etc., and you look much closer, you will find out, um, like in the case of the Ortiga says, um, deeds of trust between them and the Catholic Church uh, signed outside the Philippines, whether in Seville or in some other place. And um, Look at uh, the development. Uh, um, they they may agree to a land reform, limited land reform, but look at the kind of land reform they will agree to. The biggest uh, price for land reform were in Central Luzon and Southern Tagalog. What happened? They agreed to the la land acquisition and distribution so that they could acquire most of the lands 
after letting it happen that the small farmers allegedly could not take care of small farms themselves. So in Central Luzon and Southern Tagalog, you will not only see no, no more prosperous farmers, but no more farms. What you see are subdivisions. <laughs> what you will see are industri industries, okay? But then again, it, really, it is um, deceitful. It's quite deceiving because at the bottom of it is really land ownership, land monopoly by the Ayalas, land monopoly by the Tigreses, land monopoly by the Aranetas, by the, the, by the oligarchs from Spanish times to the present times, or new ones from coming, of course, like the Barcoses uh, joined some time back. And uh, what uh, the present uh, President Marcos II will do, well, we can observe what he will do. <laughs> but uh, the, the, the present movement, however, and fortunately are quite clear. Uh, it is important that those who are in the movement for reform are quite clear as to their alternatives. Because even from centuries back, even centuries before Christ, when the plebeians moved against the patricians, they were not clear exactly what they wanted. No? So it was given to them to limited land reform in the Licinian laws of, uh, I think, 369 BC. But afterwards, they lost all of that. By the late Roman Empire, there was only a few families that owned all of Northern Africa and most of Italy. Why? Because the same unjust uh, notion of ownership of land remained. Hmm? The notion that if this is mine, this is absolutely mine, I can do whatever I want with it, I can use it, I can abuse it, I can consume it if I could, I can throw it away. I am Lord, I am Dominion. Dominos. And that's why the early Christian philosophers said, yeah, no, of course not. You cannot do that. No? There are certain things you can own privately so that you can use them properly. But many things you can only uh, agree. You have to be no more than stewards, trust owners. Right. To be a trust owner is quite different from being an absolute owner. Now, when you have that, then you have to agree in community and uh, with your governments what to do to uh, apply the, the ideology or the philosophy in question. And uh, land value taxation is, is one of them. One, it's not everything, it's one. Uh, land acquisition and distribution in the nature of stewardship is another. There's a lot of work to do, thank you. Thank you, thank you uh, very much. So, the last the last question. Uh, yes, sir. that's right. The last question comes from um, Ukraine. Uh, it comes yes. from Dr. Olina Dronova, who joins us today from Kiev. Ah, uh, yes. Dr. Dronova points out that she would be. Uh, developing uh, another perspective from the ground. But for now, this is her question. Thank you very much for the presentation. What is the impact of the Global North multinational corporations on the economy and land of the Philippines today? I, I can read that again. Yes. I'll, I'll turn off my phone and you can read it again. Um, oh, okay. Okay, one, one more time. What, what, what is the impact of glo the Global North multinational corporations on the economy and land of the Philippines today? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a strong impact on the land, on the farmers. Because, uh, for example, when they come in and they come in big um, and the farmers do not like to sell and if farmers want to have their own cooperatives, um, often the big multinational corporations go in tandem with the local governments or with the national government 
and a lot of uh, human rights violations uh, happen. And um, so then you have the phenomenon that does not seem to go away. A farmers' organizations uh, going out to the street, going on uh, marathon demonstrations, because uh, the multinationals have not found a way of peacefully <laughs> uh, taking over. Um, the idea, I think, is uh, for a strong government that is people-oriented or the people's organizations having a big say with any government that exists to come very clear with policies and with guidelines on how Del Monte or Dole or uh, all these big corporations that uh, try to come in uh, to try to grow pineapple or coffee or whatever other commodities on a big scale, how they should uh, behave and uh, what kind of relationship with the uh, local tillers. And particularly, now I, I mentioned this, because in many places in the Philippines, this has uh, quite an impact on what we call the indigenous peoples, those who have been there a long time. And uh, that is often the case that people, uh, big corporations have a good name in Manila, they have a good PR uh, campaigns, but uh, when uh, I visit my chapters in the provinces, when I go to the mountains, then it turns out that uh, they are really regarded as so evil by the local people. Right. Thank you. I hope I answered the yes, question. We, we got that. So now you can mute your WhatsApp. Not Wait, end, huh? but mute the yeah. WhatsApp. What's up? Just mute. Just muting it will be enough. Come again. Uh, uh, just muting, muting your. Oh, okay. So I will. I I think that um, we are almost at the end uh, of the of our of the encounters uh, today, and I'd like to thank all of you uh, for coming. Uh, the session has been uh, insightful, uh, partly uh, because of your thoughtful questions. Um, partly because of the, uh, the tireless efforts of my colleagues, Sanchi and Emma, especially, but also uh, Sophia, uh, Chaita White, Ayonge, uh, and Stefan, um, and particularly because of Charles for uh, his stimulating address and authoritative uh, responses uh, to our many not so easy uh, questions. Um, so, to all of you, I say thank you very much for everything. Uh, following this pathway, the Houses Global South Encounters uh, will return next month with a talk by Dr. Olena Dronova, based at Taras Shevchenko National University of Kiev, Ukraine. From there, Dr. Dronova will seek to break the stereotypes about Kiev, uh, Ukraine, and the ongoing war. More details about the talk and our speaker will be made available on our web pages shortly. Uh, in the meanwhile, I'd like to remind you again of recent posts on just ecological political economy, uh, the Health's Global South blog. Feel free to comment on or share the post. Contributions are also uh, very welcome. Thank you and see you all again uh, next month.